Hey guys, it's Laptop Laura, and this is Copy That Pops. Writing tips and psychology hacks applied to online biz success. Whoa, oh, 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 here we go. Welcome, welcome to the show. I'm Laptop Laura, your host. And a quick little intro before we dive in with our guest to talk about the psychology of entrepreneurship, writing a book, and lessons learned from the likes of Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, and more. A heads up, there is a bit of audio clicking in this episode coming from our guest's headset. The content is so good, though, that I didn't want to hold back from sharing, and I didn't want to interrupt the flow, but I did want to let you know in advance. Hopefully, you can listen through it because the content really is great. For full show notes and even the video version of this episode, you can find it at copythatpops.com forward slash 218. And Mac's new book, Entrepreneur, How to Become an Employee Your Company Can't Live Without, can be found on Amazon by typing in copythatpops.com forward slash Mac, M-A-C-K. That'll redirect you right over there. Okay, let's dive in with my dear friend, Mac Chapman. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I definitely need to have Mac on for a round two. He is just a wealth of information and intriguing stories. Maybe we'll even share later how we punked each other when we worked in the same office years and years ago. It's too good. The stories are just too good. But for now, we'll call it a wrap here. And I look forward to seeing you next time when we'll find more ways to write copy that pops. Well, my guest today is none other than Dr. Mac Chapman. I'm so excited to have you on. So let me read your bio first, and then maybe I can share some personal things too, because we actually know each other from real life. And as a warning, listeners, if you hear some razzing, (laughs) that's par for the course with the two of us. So Dr. Chapman is best known for his extensive work in personal development through entrepreneurship and its effects on attracting and retaining middle managers in the highly competitive American high-tech industry. His research included some of the world's most recognized logos, such as Facebook, Microsoft, 3M, and IBM, just to name a few. Leveraging the discipline, tenacity, and resilience he learned as a U.S. Marine, Dr. Chapman has worked as an investment banker for prestigious firm on Wall Street and presented to Fortune 500 companies on topics from coaching peak performance to effectively communicating your vision. He continues to further his formal and informal education as a passionate lifelong learner, and he attributes much of his success, in addition to me, to our relationship. Uh, to his legendary late mentor, Jim Rohn, with whom I cannot compete, let's be honest, and the iconic cast of superstars he promoted two decades ago, including Tony Robbins, the late Zig Ziglar, and Brian Tracy. When not working in academia or conducting workshops on entrepreneurship, Dr. Chapman enjoys spending time with his family and friends and discussing germane topics of the day with a focus on solutions over finger pointing. So official welcome, Mac, to the show. Well, thank you, Miss Laura. I appreciate it. Should we not start off by harassing each other or get right into what you want to get into? I say let's harass because <laughs> <laughs> most most oh. interviews on the show over the years have been very civilized and <laughs> professional, but I'm not sure if I've had anyone on that I am as good of friends with for uh, so long and we know everything about each other and we've even done some pranks on each other, which we always like to joke about. <laughs> oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. But I would like to tell your listeners and your viewers, as well as your your fans, that they are not in any better hands than impossible to be in better hands than with you. And the reason why I say that is uh, the way our relationship started off is more as a mentor mentee. And then it kind of reversed in the later years, more as I'm the mentee and you are the mentor, because without (laughs) you, I wouldn't be where I am today doing exactly what I do today. I always give her a hard time and I read the reason I do that is because I love her. I treat her like my daughter and we go at each other. And I think what they say that iron makes iron sharper. That's our relationship. 
No, oh, that's so sweet. I didn't realize you were mentoring me before. Uh, well, <laughs> well, 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 I won't get into it. You know, Mac, uh, tell me exactly how the male species think and all the that. Oh. And I won't get into, uh, well, what do you think about this? And how about that? And how about so? OK, OK, then. So know what? She's always been my mentor. Always. <laughs> OK, I guess that's true. I am forgetting because we did get to know each other when I was in my 20s. So I had a, a lot to learn young grasshopper <laughs> you mean you're not still in your 20s holy cow that I means know. i'm old <laughs> <laughs> i do remember saying i want you to talk to me like a real guy like pretend like i'm a dude friend like talk to me straight like real and you're like you can't handle it and i was like yes i can <laughs> just try and like 30 seconds later it's like okay time out i, don't, I can't handle it <laughs> Oh, wow. There are differences. Okay. I I admit it. I admit it. (laughs) (laughs) But I I have to give you credit. You always go trying. You are one of those rare individuals that's constantly seeking more knowledge, trying to better herself. And, And I tell you what, if your listeners take nothing else away from you than that, if you follow her, she is always going to give 110%, without a doubt. That's so sweet of you. Well, and in your bio, you mentioned being a lifelong learner as well. Did you, were you always that way or did you get really inspired with your work with those legendary names that we read? Yeah. You know, Both. that's an excellent question because um, well, I grew up on the South side of Chicago, you know, probably one of the most prestigious neighborhoods in America, which is now called Chirac. So uh, learning was important because of my parents. My, my father had like a third grade education. My mother never finished high school, but all of my sisters and brothers were encouraged and demanded and we all had to go to school. We had to get a, a college degree. We had to learn. They forced that on us. They wanted our lives to be much better than their lives. So education was always stressed. However, during that period of time, I did just enough to get by just enough to, you know, basically, okay, I did that. I've satisfied that. So just enough to kind of, you know, ease by and stuff. Even when teachers were telling me you have the potential to be much, much better than that if you just apply yourself. But I was so interested in sports and uh, especially in high school. Uh, Now, all of a sudden, I understand the difference between male and female. So I, you know, I went to that avenue. (laughs) So just a ton of, ton of distractions and stuff there. So I didn't actually start thinking about lifelong learning and continue to build up until I actually uh, went to a seminar that um, Jim Rohn had conducted. And then uh, a few years later, I would start working with him. And basically, he shared some ideas with me. And one of the biggest takeaways he talked about was something that most people, I know I didn't think about, maybe, maybe most people today do think about it, but he said that your individual philosophy is going to be the determining factor of how your life turns out. And you see, back in the 70s, early 80s, I would have never thought of philosophy being the major key of how my life, I thought it was more dependent on the economy. I thought it was more dependent on uh, social issues, uh, you know, rights, wrongs, lefts, rights, things of that nature. And when when he explained this to me, when we got to actually spend uh, quality time together, we used to do dinners prior to every one of his um, his events and stuff. And we were talking. He said, no, 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 Mr. Chapman. He said, let me explain something to you. He said, I'm going to give you the good news and the bad news simultaneously. He said, what if you had to change the economy? What could you do about it? (laughs) <laughs> and I was absolutely, you have one individual. So what if you had to change your negative neighbors or cynical people or people that maybe didn't like you because of the color of your skin or your religious belief or any other belief, what would you do? How would you change them? He said, you can't. He said, so let me tell you the good news. The good news is that the only thing you can change, which is the most important thing, is yourself. And that hit me like probably a ton of bricks. I would have, I would have always thought that it was the problem. But he said, no, no, no. He said, you are the problem. He said, go to work harder on yourself than you do on any job that you work on. And I'll guarantee you that over the years, over the weeks, over the months, it has a compounding effect and you will become better. He said, because the thing of it is, is success is something you attract by the person you become. Mm 
Mm. And I took that philosophy and I applied it to just about everything, not just about everything I do in life. So I try to look objectively at how other people see situations. And when I see them going off in a in maybe a, a wrong directions, I kind of talk to them and I kind of give them some of the information that not only Jim, but uh, Tony and Brian and some of the other notable individuals, Dr. Tony Alexandra, who I, who I promoted a um, long time ago, and try to inject some of their philosophical philosophies that help these people do rather extraordinary things. These were ordinary people that have done relatively extraordinary things by probably anybody's measurement. Mm -hmm. So what age were you when you first met Jim Rohn and you were working with him? I, I, was, a, I was a stockbroker for a company called Lehman Brothers at the time. And uh, we were invited to go to a, um, a seminar. Seminar. It was them. We at the time considered it a motivational seminar and us being investment bankers, you know, we, we were selling to uh, major companies. I worked in Chicago on LaSalle street, which is the equivalent of wall street in New York. And so we went a group of us, and this was the first time I ever heard anyone speaking in the terms. I did have a couple of recordings from uh, Earl Nightingale with the old uh, 78s that was actually on what was called a, um, recording machine, a record player. That's what we call them as kids, a record player. They're so old. They're in the museums now. But so I, I had I had a little of that, but the way he did it, he does it. In, in fact, we nicknamed him the uh, Velvet Hammer because he made it, he, he made so many points and I was, I just couldn't keep up with all the notes that I was trying to take to capture uh, some of the philosophicals. And then back in those days, they would sell cassette reporters. Uh, mm -hmm. CDs hadn't came out yet. So, and so I bought in the back of the room, I bought a number of cassettes that he had for different programs and stuff. And I kind of immersed myself. So when I would ride back and forth to work, I would put that in the car and I would, you know, kind of emerge myself before I got into work and stuff. So, and it really, really helped and it affected my business in a positive way. I was able to some major, major accounts, do a lot of major things with Lehman Brothers. Uh, we had a very successful CEO at the time. He was based out of New York, but he was the uh, undersecretary. Uh, he was the secretary of commerce under Richard Nixon. And his name was Pete Peterson. Uh, he, if you Google him, he, Pete was, uh, he, he was just an incredible, incredible leader. I remember the first time he came to Chicago to, we had a cocktail party to visit his investment bankers and his stockbrokers there. I remember he came and walked up to me because I was the only African-American in there. And he said, he said, he looked at me and he looked at my dress. He said, I obviously pay you too much. I said, sir, you don't pay me enough. So we became real, <laughs> real good friends. And, and he had a great, he had a great managerial philosophy. Now he's super successful businessman. And he uh, does a lot. He used to do a lot for charities when he was alive. And what, what Pete said is he said, listen, he said, my most valuable asset are you guys, my, my employees. He said, not the Quotrons. There were no computers back in those days. They were called Quotrons, where we could get the quotes directly from Wall Street uh -huh. to get prices so that we could share with our, with our customers. And he said, all of this stuff, he said, I, we could throw it. He said, you guys are the most important. He said, that's why I tell all of my branch managers, including mine. He said, listen, he said, if you have to fire any one of these employees, what I want you to do is I want you to submit their, their papers along with your resignation. Now I'll decide whether oh, wow. or not to accept it. So it puts so much pressure on the brain. Oh, wow. managers. So now you have to now listen to this. Now you have to make sure that those human resources that we have, my most valuable prize possessions are hitting on all cylinder. And unless they did something as, as far egregious. as it's important, very yeah, egregious, yeah. you, you were told. So that got the best of our management to the best of each and every one of us. And, and he wanted to make sure uh, Steven Spielberg, Steven, his last name was uh, Steven, I call him Steven Spielberg, but it was Steven uh, St Steyer. And Steven used to make sure at each day and, and in the evening before we left to go over our numbers, to go over our, our strategy, what we did, 
how our conversations went. And so some of the best one-on-one coaching and stuff, and he, and he was dealing with probably 16, 17 of us at the time, but I mean, he just, he went 110% as did everything. And that's what made really helped to make um, Lehman Brothers at the time, one of the, the most premier and elite brokerage houses. We were one of the first that went into uh, to the retail game and started n- not only investment banking, but also we went to the general public and stuff. And many years later, they got into a lot of trouble and went a little too aggressive and didn't have that type of leadership anymore. And yeah. unfortunately, that was their demise. Yeah. And so the managers also knew this policy when they were hiring too. So they took extra care in hiring, would you say? Well, Pete came along after I was hired. So the managers had been there longer and they were under Mm. different leadership. It was something that he instituted Mm. when he came aboard and it showed. So instead of staying in your little uh, corner office there with, you Uh, know, with all the uh, gadgets, you were more out in on the uh, floor and uh, finding out what the heck was going on and seeing if you could uh, get any individual the help that they needed or find out where, where they were perhaps slipping up at so that they could correct that as quick as possible and to be as, as effective as possible. That's amazing. I've never heard that type of a situation like setup. <laughs> <Smart. Yeah. laughs> well, that's why he was a brilliant. And I mean, he was mm-hmm. the head of, uh, he was uh, Nixon's secretary of commerce. So I mean, wow. business was his business. Yeah. And he was our CEO. So how did you transition from investment banking to promoting these incredible speakers? And- okay. So shortly after that, my cousin and I, we had a corporation that uh, we formed uh, and he was in California. He had a trade show business. So we used to uh, rent uh, carpet and do all types of uh, ancillary services for various trade shows. And so we had that business uh, together for about 10 years. And I was in California. And after that, uh, we sold it to a company out of Chicago and they purchased it. So I was trying to figure out what did I want to do when I grow up? <laughs> and just so happened, um, this is when Anthony Robbins was uh, was coming out. And so uh, I had listened to some of his infomercials on late night television. I ordered some of them. And he was talking about this guy, Jim Rohn. I said, oh, wow, I remember that name, Jim Rohn. I'm looking into the LA Sun-Times, the LA uh, Times at the time, in their ads, and I was looking for business opportunities more than a, than a job. And I found this thing about speakers needed. Now, I've never did any public speaking in my entire life. And, but they were having auditions. And so, uh, and, and it was for Jim Rohn to, to promote Jim Rohn. I said, wow, I said, this would be interesting. And so I went down there, I did the interview. I, uh, did well, uh, they moved me into the next stage and then they, uh, put me into a training. We probably had a couple of weeks training on some of the philosophies of Jim. And They're then really be- fast. what was that first interview like? Okay, what it was is basically to find out if you knew anything about Jim Rohn, where your philosophy was on self-development, self-improvement, you know, what type of background you had. Also, too, I think they were sizing you up to find out if you would look good in front of the room or if, if you if you had enough confidence to present in front of the room and stuff. Well, good looks, check, right? <laughs> no, I, but trust me, I... They helped to develop this. I th- th- this I would have been. Are you crazy? I'm not going to stand up in front of a bunch of people. But but uh, but they that was actually part of someone. Uh, I remember a young lady. She she saw something in me and she gave me the opportunity. And two weeks later, I was in Boston, Massachusetts, getting ready to talk to companies about uh, Jim Rohn and promoting it. And, and we we had what we call pods, uh, similar to the way consulting firms have it. It was usually a group of four of us. We mm-hmm. go into a city for like eight weeks and we do nothing but promote Jim Rohn. And, and when we say promote, I mean all out. We would call radio stations. We would mm-hmm. tra- we would um, we would actually uh, barter with them uh, tickets to our program mm-hmm. for coming in and speaking to their sales staff. So we would, back then, uh, cell phones were just coming out. So we would we would go and tell the uh, cell phone companies, listen, if you loan us four of your cell phones with 
free service. We'll let your entire staff come uh, for free to our program. So we had free cell for service in that particular. Uh, we had a number of other companies. We would always uh, barter with the uh, local uh, business uh, journal there so we can get mm. a good full page ad and give them tickets as well. And we put 2,000, 3,000 people into a program. Wow. And then uh, what we would do is, of course, Jim would come into town the night before, boom, we'd all have dinner with him. We kind of go over, you know, what we think. And then what we would do is, uh, as he was, as one of us would, would introduce him, and then one of us would come on the breaks and tell him, hey, and generally it was me, they would put me up there to try to sell Jim. I say, hey, listen, um, for those of, how would how do you like this so far? And everybody was enthusiastic. I said, how would you like to take Jim home with you? I said, now, ladies, don't get excited. <laughs> He's married at the time. I said, but we do have tapes in the back of the room to take home with him. So th- those those were kind of things. So we used to have a lot of fun. We'd have a ball. And then we'd go from city to city. To city. So we were like vagabonds, actually. <laughs> that sounds fun. It was. But how it did was. you get the skills to be good at sales? Was it the training slash some natural talent started to emerge? Well, um, m- most of my training for sales came from Lehman Brothers, and they had a very extensive. Back in my day, when you wanted to become a stockbroker, you had to study for six months prior to sitting for the New York Stock Exchange exam. Now they have an exam that covers all of that. And then for every state that you wanted to uh, to sell in, you had to take there. So when you'd come back after that six months taking and passing the New York Stock Exchange exam, every state that you wanted to sell in, you had to sit for their exam. Generally, those were only 25, uh, 35 questions versus the 250 we had on the New York Stock Exchange exam. But they had mm-hmm. embedded in their training system a sales sales trading, exactly how to, how to speak to people individually, how to uh, ask open-ended questions, how to listen effectively. And so all of those things were, were entrenched already in me. They didn't t- teach me how to be a public speaker. They didn't teach me how to sell because when you're selling one-on-one, that's one set of skills. When you're mm-hmm. selling an entire group, that's a whole different set of skills and stuff. So I learned them under Jim Rohn. That's amazing. So from a psychological perspective, what are some key takeaways someone listening might want to jot down or or think about that you learned from your time with Jim and promoting the others? Well, I think the biggest takeaway would be that we as individuals, a lot of times we like to justify our mediocrity or our failure. And so what happens is, is that we, we start blaming other things and other people, just like I was doing. I was blaming other situations. Uh, and so what happens is, is once we, that's the bad and the good news. The good news is, is that you can change yourself starting today. You can change yourself. And what it takes to change yourself is to be honest with yourself and open with yourself we all have faults. We all could improve in various areas. But Jim used to say that the shortest pencil is worth more than the longest memory. So everything that you think that you need to change, you need to write down. You need to be able to see it. You need to be able to understand it. And then you need to be able to map out why it's so important for you to change X in order to get to Z. That's the key. The key is that you have to see it. In fact, most uh, Jim used to always have a, a funny saying. He said, listen, if you go out and win the lottery tomorrow and you become a millionaire, you best hurry up and end up being a mental millionaire because if not, uh, money and a, and, a, and a fool will certainly part. And then we've, I mean, they have television shows about there, how the lottery ruined my life. Mm. So it's, it's important to understand that a lot of this is between our ears. And, and I know we're dealing with a lot of um, psychological issues now in, in business and corporations and stuff. And I think some of this, not all of it, but some of it can be mitigated by how we approach who we are and what we want to be. Because you can be, thank God we live in America, the greatest country in the world, but you can become anything and everything you want to be. And the secret that uh, Zig Ziglar used to say is all you have to do is help enough other people get what they want. Forget about what you want and concentrate on other people getting what they want. Hmm. That's a good one. 
So let's transition a bit to your book. So you just published a book. You hit number one in eight categories on your launch. And it's wow, all I better about, buy it. Yeah, you better go buy it. Now, actually, if you go to copy that pops.com forward slash Mac, M-A-C-K, it'll redirect you right to the book on Amazon. So you don't have to go searching. Can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> yes, go get it, people. <laughs> so it's all about entrepreneurship. Will you first define what entrepreneurship is? Okay. And what I want people to understand is don't let this funny word really confuse you. Now, entrepreneurship was a term that was coined by a business consultant and his wife, uh, Clifford Pinochet. And what it is, is it's being an entrepreneur within an organization. And yes, there are some differentiating skills that will make you successful as an entrepreneur that you don't need as an entrepreneur. And so an entrepreneur is just the business person, man or woman, who would like to start a company, a product, a service, or process within an organization in order to help that organization grow and bring more value to the company. So an entrepreneur is just a innovative individual. Some people now call them design thinkers, innovators, uh, but they're just individuals that are, are passionate about ideas. They're really, really big into looking at problems. They're not afraid of problems. Problems are their friend because when you're able to solve problems, and that's what life is all about, solving problems, you can't, you're not going to get out of this world without problems. So the key is to become good at that process and to develop those skills of becoming a problem solver. And what my book does is give them some details, some characteristics that's known uh, to some of the most successful entrepreneurs of our time, and also some actual tools in the back of the book that actually helps them to design and create processes, test them to find uh, what type of validity and efficacy that it may have in order to get them to where they would like to be. But that entrepreneur, he or she has to also understand the corporate culture of their organization. They have to understand the corporate politics that's going to be played within that organization because everybody's vying for resources. And if you take resources from X, somebody is going to be negatively impacted. So you're going to have to have a much stronger winning argument in order to probably receive those, those resources. Hmm. So what are a couple of the most important skills? I mean, I all of them are important, but if you had to give our audience just a couple, what would you say? I would say probably is the tenacity, hmm. being tenacious, because the majority of proposals are going to fail. And the ones that are successful are probably going to be, and this is pretty much a proven statistic, is probably going to be altered probably around 66% of the time significantly from the original idea that you have created. So it's going to take persistency and tenacity in order for you. You said you had the idea for X and it's coming out XA or XB. And you can't be bent out. You have to understand that that is part of the process. Not only that, it's also part of probably some of the uh, political internal challenges that you may have. Because if, if I'm from Department A and somebody made a suggestion that's viable from Department B, now it's more collaborative and stuff. And now you have both departments fighting for that to become a, mm -hmm. what I like to call an MVP, a minimally viable product, so that it's likelihood of getting passing mustard and actually getting paying customers for it is more likely. So can you give the audience a tangible example of something that maybe was developed inside of a company by entrepreneurial thinkers? Yes, I can. Let, let me give you, let me give you one of my favorite. My yeah. favorite is, is uh, 3M. <laughs> 3M. 3M had contracted, had told two of their um, engineers to develop an adhesive so mm. powerful that it could stick to anything. However, after about uh, 18 months to two years, it was a total flop. It absolutely barely stuck to anything. <laughs> now, 
Along comes another engineer, a number, this is about six to, don't quote me on the exact time frame, but I think it was almost, almost nine years later, almost oh, wow. nine years later, um, one of the other enge- newer engineers that got there, who was also very big in the uh, church choir, had asked about this adhesive. And what he did was, because he was in the choir, he was having problems with the hymn book going back and forth to uh, to the various songs. Mm. So he took these little pieces of paper and he used that adhesive that could barely stick to anything and he stuck it in side by side. It worked for him. He was fascinated. Then he started using it at work. Other people start observing him and they all <laughs> start using it. And lo and behold, it became what we know today as post-it notes, and it only sells about 50 billion of them each and every year. It made him a superstar as well as financially comfortable for the rest of his life. So those, they came from a mistake. That was a mistake. A mistake became a success. Now, one of my others, if I may, is <laughs> the uh, is a janitor for a company called Frito Lay. You ever had uh, Frito Lay? Well, he came, <laughs> he came up with the uh, the idea of the flaming, the uh, actually one that was the uh, flaming uh, variety, the hot, the hot, the hot the Cheetos. Cheetos. I'm, <laughs> I mean, this came from the janitor, but at least Frito Lay smart enough to have a system where he could actually present that, and it actually got serious consideration, and and it and it came to fruition. So th- those are two uh, two extremes and and success. But here's a modest one: um, corrections uh, employee in the state of Massachusetts. They were working on a process to. Uh, they were on a paper system, and they came up with a computerized system for fingerprinting and ID individuals that ended up saving the state uh, $50,000. Well, that's not the end of the world. That's not all the money in the world. But for a state agency or any government agency to be able to save $50,000 is a real cool. So these these inventions and, and these ideas and processes and procedures are a way to save companies money. They don't have to be multi-million. They can be in the tens of thousands of dollars because every penny counts. If you don't believe me, ask your executive staff. Yeah. And I think that there has been a culture, which is great, of really idolizing entrepreneurs, but it's not necessarily cut out for everyone to start their own business and they maybe love their company. So I feel like this could be a great way to get out that innovative, creative spirit while still inside of your company. Absolutely. And for all of my uh, fellow, because I was considered at one point in my life, a serial entrepreneur, I owned cookie shops and all types of other different businesses. But I would suggest to them that the information that they would get out of this book, if it's good enough for a multi-billion dollar corporation, trust me, it'll be good for mom and pa store. Mm -hmm. And the reason why these skill sets are transferable. They give you a little bit more than you need than for a traditional entrepreneur because they talk about a lot of the political culture and understanding the political culture. You don't have to do that if you are an entrepreneur. You you pretty much make your own decisions un- unless you're using uh, ca- funds that are raised by uh, mm. uh, venture capitalists and stuff. And of course, they're going to have certain uh, things and necessary for you to, in order to get the funds, in order to maintain the funds, in order for you to uh, maintain a portion of of ownership. So these skills are applicable for entrepreneurs as well as intrapreneurs. Mm -hmm. Now, I just went after that niche market because uh, coming out of COVID uh, and a lot of the psychological factors and so many uh, surveys have indicated how many people are just so unhappy with Mm. the work they're doing. I think what they're really unhappy with is not being recognized for the type of work that they do and the achievements that they accomplish and perhaps this could give them the skill sets in order to overcome some of that. So it might have a, a, a small help with the psychological factor of um, having employees feel so much better about themselves. Because when individuals have the autonomy to be creative and come up with ideas, uh, they have a tendency to work much longer and mm-hmm. much harder and be much more focused and be much more excited 
about the job. And that's really what uh, retention is looking for in corporation after corporation. We're looking, how, how do we make our people happy? That's so true. What would you recommend to someone who's like, okay, Mac, I got the book. I'm going through the skills. I'm working on those. I, I like my company. I want to do more creative, innovative things, but my organization isn't conducive to that per se. Well, would you, you say get a different job or would you say think outside the box? Two different things, two different things that I would, I would suggest to an individual like that. And, and, and that is, that's been asked several times different times. And what I would uh, I would say is number one is there is, a, and I explained in the book what a hackathon is. There's a way to present your idea within the organization to show them the feasibility because part of the nine-step process is, is actually testing it and showing what methodology you used in order to show your your leadership uh, that it's viable. Now, let's say, for example, they still have absolutely no interest in, and you can prove that it's viable. I would suggest that if you have the resources, of course, start your own business. If not, I would suggest perhaps looking at competitors that you feel that would actually be able to utilize and be able to actually see, in fact, what great interviewing technique it would be is, is if you say, hey, listen, I'm applying for this job, but I'm applying for this job because I have some specific ideas and I can show you and you have them sign an NDA so they don't steal your idea. And then you show them out. I mean, that you're showing unbelievable value prior to coming in, because mm. if you use the nine step process, you have to show where it is viable and you already have customers that are willing to pay for it. Hmm. Will you tell us a little bit more about the nine step process? Maybe not every detail because people need it. Well, type well in, but. okay. Yeah. But because what, what happens is, is this is because it's, it starts out with an idea and what I do is I caution them to make sure that they put together their team that doesn't involve a lot of uh, groupthink. Mm. Because if, if you come up with an idea and you say, I think this idea is perfect, that's not where you start. You don't start with ideas. What you do is you start with the problem. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Mm. So what you want to do is you want to come up with that. And then you want let, to let individuals without any types of communication with each other to come back with solutions to mm. that particular problem. And so part of the, that first step is to make sure that you don't get get inundated in a group think or or if let's say for example you're the CEO of of or you're the head of that particular group you should not say hey mac i think we should do xyz you should say mac this is the problem our customers are looking for this this and this and they don't currently don't have it and they need it at this price is there anything we could do? And then let the rest of us, the rest of your team go back and say, I want you to come back. I don't want you to talk to each other. I want you to talk individually. We will get together. We'll do some cue storming, which is question storming by uh, Dr. Mary Lee and, and start asking because every problem can be solved if we can formulate the correct question. And, and that's, and that's where, that's where this nine step process takes you It make mm -hmm. sure that you start off with a good, strong foundation of finding out what the problem statement is. And then you're going to move through the rest of the stages through that and stuff. And, and one of the stages, of course, is uh, creating a methodology of, of being able to test it. Also to one of the stages is for you to observe the end user. So you want to go mm -hmm. see, you want to go physically be where your customers are going to be purchasing. And not only are you going to be wanting to observe how this would impact them buying it, but you want to see what their daily habits are. Mm -hmm. Do they do certain things? And the reason being is because here again, that 66% I'm saying that that generally gets uh, alterated. You may discover something within the observation process that, oh, wow, you know what, this is good, but this other thing would be great because this is what 
this particular population is really having challenges with. So observation mm-hmm. is key. Observation is important. And, and then tying it all together, then you need to go back and you need to be able to present that because most of the customers want to know in order to find out if you have a successful product, what's going to happen is you're going to get certain buying questions. Your potential client who you've been uh, studying and using as a guinea pig will now say, Laura, how much is that going to cost? Or when do you think that would be ready? And how soon do you think we could? These are all buying questions and you know you have a viable product or process at that particular time. Mm, That sounds fun. Now, how does writing and writing skills fit into any all of this, if at all? Well, listen, if you're if you're not a good communicator, if you can't communicate in writing, first of all, it's probably going to turn off the readers, which are probably going to be your sponsor as well as your champion. And they're going to be embarrassed to present it in a mm-hmm. committee of, of any viability. So you need to make sure that you're highly proficient in writing and make sure that you're able to concisely get over your idea. And I also uh, teach in the, uh, how to make sure that you have uh, at least a 90 second elevator pitch mm-hmm. so that you can, uh, you can at least get someone, pique someone's interest into it so that, uh, that you can uh, get champions and other internal uh, uh, allies in the organization. What are some aspects or qualities of good written communication from your perspective? You well, mentioned concise. Yeah. So, so for example, you don't want to bloviate. You don't want to, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to make this big mushroom of an explanation when you could do it in uh, two sentences. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to give a person a paragraph because you got to remember the people that you're selling to or trying to sell, not the end product, but the idea mm-hmm. is your, is fellow business people. And these people are usually vice presidents above. They don't have a lot of time. They need to know it. At what's the bottom line? What's the bottom? Hey, give it to me. Give it. And they needed mm-hmm. to know it like that. So if you're if you're writing a, a dissertation, uh, the likelihood of them, you know, putting that into the uh, trash heap is very high. You you need to you need you need shots, bullets, understandable, and you need to speak their language mm-hmm. because every corporation has their own internal language and lingo, and you need to be able to speak it in their terms and show how it's viable to their customer base or potential base because you may be expanding your customer base. Mm. And maybe even understanding the specific personality of the manager or whomever you're trying to get their buy-in. So how you write might be different depending on which level you're writing to. Exactly. Because uh, even in organizations that I've worked in before, I've had uh, managers who uh, say, uh, listen, you know, uh, if if you got something to send me and it's be and you're forwarding it from someone else, just put a FYI. And then I had another C section. I said, listen, never put an FYI. I, give me an explanation. So so you're going to be dealing with different personalities, <laughs> many, different idiosyncrasies. So that that's just that's just par for the course, though. That that's mm-hmm. part of it. That's part of it and mm-hmm. stuff. And it's and and you bring up a good point. It's. If you understand who you're going to be selling to, say, for example, you've had some interactions with uh, your vice president or or his boss, maybe a C-suite individual, and you have some type of understanding of his personality or her, or persona- her. <laughs> or her personality, now you are in a better position to position it. But say, for example, you don't know her personality or his personality, then what you're going to try to do is try to use your, your either your LinkedIn network or someone you know at the organization that maybe knows his assistant or knows him and say, how is John? How is Mary? You know, how is Sally? Uh, you know, what, you know, is, is she a fast talker, slow talker? Uh, mm-hmm. is, is she methodical? Is she analytical? Is she more emotional? And so that's it. And I will tell you this, as mm-hmm. we, as I speak on this thing called emotion, all of these, pro- 90% of this products that you bring that becomes viable will be sold on emotion. It'll stay on logic, but it will be hmm. sold on emotion. And it's important, important to tap into that. How? Easy. Finding out who your audience is. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're appealing 
to their emotional side. So you have to have some understanding of, of, of uh, personalities. And if, if you're talking to a very logical, mathematical-minded individual like yourself, I'd, I'd have to do it in numbers. I'd have to be able to, but I'd have to do it in such a way to show how what the benefit is. So I have to talk about the reward mm-hmm. and how it's going to make you, if you're my boss, how, you know, you'll probably, if this thing works, you know, you're probably going to be a superstar and you'll probably end up in the C-suite appealing more mm-hmm. to your emotion and what the benefit is to you because everybody's into that radio station. We all heard about WWFMI. What's it for me. <laughs> I like that station. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh, I love that. Lots of great takeaways in there. Do you have a little bit more time? Yes, I do. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about why did you decide to write the book and how did you write it? Like the nitty gritty for people who are thinking about writing books. Yes. Did you write it in word? Did you handwrite it and then have it transcribed? Did you speak it out? Yes. So as you personally know, I'm the world's slowest typist. So, and I've, I've been a huge, huge fan of Dragon Speak. However, I didn't use Dragon Speak to speak it out. I actually used the uh, program that came with uh, Microsoft Word, oh. and I actually, and I actually used that. And I will say how I wrote this. First of all, you have always been an inspiration to me, and I finally got off of my lazy rear end to actually do something, and. What I did is, first of all, I came up with, okay, what would this book have and what audience am I actually going after? So my niche market was individuals that have jobs that uh, may be on the fence of looking for another job or looking for entrepreneurial businesses and stuff to just give them an alternative uh, to look at or to contemplate. And like I said, the book is also written for entrepreneurs and to uh, give them the opportunity. So what I did is I spoke it into Microsoft Word and I came up with the various chapters and I came up with the um, reason for them. So I talk about in the beginning of the book, the reason why I wrote the book and, and, and some of the things that helped to develop me the person I am, and kind of after the niche market that I was uh, was actually uh, trying to address and trying to to bring some benefit to. So, mm-hmm. I would suggest that anybody that that wants to write a book, to first of all come up with something that that they thought of. And before you tell me that, oh, well, everybody's thought of everything. Well, let me tell you something. Just because everybody's thought of everything, it doesn't mean that you're opinion and your particular expertise is not just as important. We can, we can, you can, they've got 5,000 different books on the keto diet. So, and and all of them are selling. So the thing of it is, is that if you're interested in, and there's at least one book in everybody. So first Mm -hmm. of all, I believe the book that you leave your kids, your grandkids will be better than the old sofa you leave them and stuff. At least it will have some of your thoughts, how grandma, grandpa, or ma and dad was thinking at that particular time. So Mm -hmm. I suggest and urge everyone, everyone to definitely, definitely try and think about writing a book. And once you get into it and once it starts flowing, you'll notice that uh, just get so motivated and you'll want to make sure you capture everything. And that's the reason why I couldn't let my limited typing skills uh, be a detriment. And I decided to talk it. And of course, I had to make a lot of corrections because the computer wasn't understanding everything. So, and, you know, you go back and you read it and you readjust. But I tell you, it's it's much quicker than any human can write. And mm-hmm. it's so much easier. It's so much easier. And make sure, make sure you have a good uh, program to as far as the grammar and also it's suggested that if you're writing in a passive voice and things of that nature. So you make that adjustment. So that's that's how I formulated. Then I, I had an individual to actually format it, thanks to you, uh, to format it to the specifications that's required um, in, in Amazon to mm-hmm. to actually get get published and stuff so for kindle uh, and for yes for uh, for Mm -hmm. kindle paperback and also for audible you know so uh, yes 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 so yeah on speaking of that sorry to to interrupt your flow you're getting people to audition their voice to do the reading 
of the book. So you don't even have to do it yourself if you don't have time or you don't exactly, want to. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because, and, and, and the challenge with that is if you're going to read your own book, uh, you're going to have to have a nice mic like you have right there. Mm-hmm. You're going to really need to form a little studio either in your closet or somewhere in the house to make sure all the just like you keep hearing the crackling of this this yeah. uh, this <laughs> nonsense that would show up. I was not ready to go through the aggravation and the time and hours to uh, to do that. Mm-hmm. So it was better for me to uh, to sub that out to uh, to another gentleman um, who who's done a wonderful job on it. That's amazing. Yeah, and people can go to acx.com. It's the Audible. I think it's called Audio Book Exchange, Audio Book Creation Exchange. I forget what the C stands for now. But that is the option available to anybody for free. So you can even share royalties with the person who does the reading or pay them up front. You know, it's up to the person. And to add to that, I, with my, both of my books that are live so far, I plan to do the reading myself because I've got a mic. I know how to edit the audio. And guess what? They're not up there because you get busy and it is really tedious. You start to do it and then you mess up so that, you, you know, you have to go back and refix it and edit all the stuff and it. It's just easier to send that out to a professional. It is because when I was um, reviewing as uh, he was actually doing the speaking and they send section by section by section over, it it is more than a notion. So I take my hat off to you for doing that. But, you know, you're a superstar. I know that um, I know that, uh, you know, you uh, have wings and you generally fly around, (laughs) typically not on a broomstick, but, you know, (laughs) sometimes, (laughs) sometimes, (laughs) never when you push me too far, (laughs) (laughs) never, ever, ever. But uh, but not only that, I, I love listening to your voice. So and I'm sure your your fans do, too. So there would be no Laura book without Laura. Well, but, but it is now. And my first book I published in the end of 2016 and here we are in 2022 and it's not live. Okay. So because I get just, up off of it. No, I, I need to hire someone even yes, though yes, it would yes, be great, yes, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm talking that, myself true. into that. You know? Yes. Yes. So that, and, and that is, that is, that that's important. That's important because, uh, and then, you know, you get to interview all these wonderful people. Most of them are, are act actors and actresses mm. who, uh, who, part of SAC. And so uh, they, and it's just a wide variety. I mean, That's I had like cool. 30 something different. I said, wow, it was, it was a real tough decision to, to make and stuff. You have some unbelievably excellent people there. That's fun. Mm-hmm. So any other tips or advice for someone who wants to write a book? Let's say they're like, okay, I agree with you. I need to get stuff out there. Because whatever I write right now, it's going to help people a few steps behind me. And if no one buys the book, it's still a little bit of a legacy for my kids and grandkids. I wish I could read a book that my great great grandmother wrote. I don't care That's what the topic sure. would be on. Exactly. I would be just exactly. fascinated. Unbelievable. On um, that that to me, you know, you you've taken the words out. But what what I would do, and this is because I know you, I would contact you. And I would start a conversation with you and I would get advice from you because let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, you would be in no better hands than the great Laura, Laura Peterson. And I know her head is getting bigger and she probably won't be able to fit out the door. Well, she'll, it she'll deflated probably. when you mispronounced my first name. Okay. Laura? You said Laura, Laura. What's her name? Laura uh, Peterson. Whatever. Peterson. <laughs> Peter. And that's what I used to call her anyway. Peter. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> Until the dubious uh, Petersons uh, made the news that I wouldn't call her Peterson anymore. Oh, right. Yeah, that, that one was crazy. Who- Lacey killed Peterson, Lacey and the, Peterson, well, and then the other one that killed his wife. Ah, yeah, it's just crazy, crazy, crazy. Boy, no I, relation, no, no relation. No, absolutely not. But if anyone who who's serious about writing a book, and I hope everyone is, uh, that's listening to this podcast, if they would just reach out to you, do an evaluation with you, uh, uh, spend some time with you. She has taught me so, you know what I, yes, I have a doctorate, but you know what? She gave me a second PhD in, <laughs> in how to do a book. And let me tell you, so I can't give her enough kudos. I love this woman to death. Well, thank you. That's so sweet of you. And I can tell people that if they want to get started, 
for a complete free, they can go to copy that pops.com forward slash free. And I moved my entire course that I used to charge people for, and I made it hundred percent available on for free online. Wow. Wow. So people I mean, get so, started right away. <laughs> so the thing of it is, is Jim Rohn would say, there's no excuse. What Jim Rohn used to, t- mm. and what we, he used to have us tell people in our speeches is this, is he said, listen, he said, all the knowledge in the world is located in a place called the public library. However, less than 30% of people have a library card. Hmm. And I used to go to a town, let's say I was in Miami, and I said, well, let me ask you this. Maybe you guys haven't got that yet, that the library cards here in Miami is free. But this is a news bulletin. So the resources there, especially being online, Mm -hmm. is so overwhelming for individuals that want to do anything worthwhile with their lives, they can research it. And to have a resource such as yourself being able to go and get something that is extremely valuable for free. Me, as a doctor of business administration, I would say you should always charge something because people that get it for free uh, don't value it. I think you should jack up the price, but that's your decision. You're making it free. And, and the thing of it is, is anybody that doesn't take advantage of that, then, you know, shame on it. Blame the government. <laughs> it's yeah. the politicians that's keeping you back. Yeah. Yeah. No excuses. Yeah. There's definitely so much information out there. I feel like sometimes people do get overwhelmed by the volume of information. So hopefully things like the program that I made free is at least it's organized and condensed in a clear way that it is a path that can be followed. It's not the only path, but it's the one that works for me and past clients. To well, get well going. what's important about your program is this is I don't know if all of your listeners know that you were a high school teacher. That's true. <laughs> you you teach exactly like you're in your classroom and you make sure we comprehend. She slapped me around a number of times, said, you don't understand, do you? Pop, pop, pop. <laughs> and so, and I had to come to reality. So listen, whatever you do, you go see, see my girl and she will take care of you because she, she put me on the path. Entrepreneur would not have happened with the type of success and with the type of promotion that I have without this young lady right here. So 110% endorsement on my part. Well, thank you. That's so sweet of you. So how can people connect with you, reach out, learn more, or, or do you want them to leave you alone? (laughs) <laughs> not at all. I see, first of all, I love people and I love yeah. talking to people and I love interacting, but they can, uh, they can reach me via email at M Chapman at E X S U I T E solutions. That's E X S U I T E sweet solutions. S O L U T I O N S. M Chapman at dot com. So M Chapman at X Suite Solutions dot com. Yes, yes. Nice. It, it, the name of the company is Executive Suite Solutions. So I was able to get EX instead of yeah. putting a long executive. That would be long. <laughs> that is long. That would be against our copywriting principles if it was too <laughs> long. See, see, there you go. See, I, I didn't even know that then, but see, I. <laughs> That's that's because of our relationship. I just felt it that it would have been wrong. The force is so strong with you. So of your best mentors in life, you would say Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, Laura Peterson. Is that fair? Pretty, well, you know, I would say uh, Laura Peterson is probably heads and shoulders among those other guys. Oh, I no. mean, those are- <laughs> <laughs> that even just feels uncomfortable. <laughs> to to hey, listen, I, you listen. Remember, I was a Marine, so let me put the pressure on you. Mm. So I expect you to be out there talking. I expect you to be doing your uh, YouTube channel and getting back out there and stuff. People are getting back into the society now. People need your service more than ever now. A lot of colleagues, especially the ones, uh, my mm. colleagues that have PhDs, uh, yeah. you know, each and every one of them want to write a book, needs to write a book. I'm going to send each, I'm going to tell them, I said, listen, if you're serious and you're committed, you don't want to leave this planet without at least leaving one book, especially mm. as, as a PhD, someone who uh, has so much to share, who's already pretty much written a book in their dissertation. 
<laughs> and uh, and be able to uh, to actually either piggyback off of that of the work they've already researched, they've already done, to differentiate them from everybody else with uh, with doctorates. Mm. That one more thing that makes me think of too is having a book helps you do more speaking, and you've done a lot of speaking and promote a lot of speakers. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. In fact, one of, <laughs> in fact, I'm kind of in a dilemma here because uh, one of uh, my uh, competitors is looking to buy a block of my books for their new hiring orientation and stuff. So they're going to use my book against the company that I work for <laughs> to. Oh, to, wow. <laughs> so, so I, I've, I've spoken to someone in my C-suite, so we're going to see if we can, uh, we can augment that. It's, <laughs> but, That's I, interesting. I, yeah. but I tell you what, that would probably be one of the heights of my uh, life. If somebody, if, if they've taken that and, and actually ran with it and actually yeah. did some amazing things and helped change people's lives for the better. I don't care. Beat yeah. us. <laughs> well, I know your book is going to spread like wildfire, even beyond what we've done so far. And if anyone's interested, go to copy that pops.com forward slash Mac, and it'll redirect them right to the book on Amazon. They don't still have to go searching for it and reach out to you, connect with you at mchapman at xsuitesolutions.com. Any other things you want to leave the audience with? No, I just want to let them know that, hey, listen, um, life is short, not guaranteed. So if you have a dream, a life is too short not to live your dream. I witnessed this young lady right here come up with dreams and just about do everything. She's traveled all over the world. That's what she wanted to do. She's made great uh, real estate investments. You are in such good hands with this young lady right here, and you would be just missing out on a major opportunity for yourself if you don't connect with the great Laura Peterson, my mentor. Well, thank you. I didn't want this to turn into an infomercial for me. Listen, listen, when you're good, you're just good. I got to take you around everywhere I go. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I was hoping for. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for your time, Max. Thank you. Any excuse to talk with you, I'll take it. (laughs) Ditto. You have a great one now. (laughs) You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I definitely need to have Mac on for a round two. He is just a wealth of information and intriguing stories. Maybe we'll even share later how we punked each other when we worked in the same office years and years ago. It's too good. The stories are just too good. But for now, we'll call it a wrap here. And I look forward to seeing you next time when we'll find more ways to write copy that pops. Thanks so much for listening. Let's keep the conversation going. You can find more at copythatpops.com and I'm at Laptop Laura on all the socials. Sometimes we find the greatest things in life.